Well, hello and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today we have a um, really interesting new open source project that you probably haven't heard about, Jaeger. Uh, you probably have heard about Uber. Um, and we're really pleased to have Yuri with us. Um, he's one of the core contributors to um, Jaeger. And he's going to tell us about how all this works with open tracing and Prometheus and lots of other um, aspects of um, distributed tracing today. And we also have with us um, from Red Hat, Gary Brown, who's another one of the contributors to the project. And um, we're just hoping to build some awareness around Jaeger and get more of you involved in the community. And so the format we're going to use for today is we're going to let Yuri and Gary do their presentation. You can ask questions in the chat. Um, and we'll have an open live Q&A at the end. And all of this is being recorded. So don't try and scribble notes fast. Uh, there will be all the links at the end to the references for all of the stuff that we're talking about. And with that, I'm going to let Yuri take it away and introduce himself. And um, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you, Dan. Um, so um, just a few words about myself. I'm an engineer at Uber. Uh, we have an observability team in New York City, which does uh, things like metrics, uh, login, and tracing, and uh, other uh, observability-related applications. Uh, and I have been a tech lead for Jaeger project at Uber uh, for about two years, uh, and we've open sourced that project back in April this year. Um, I also was uh, involved in the open tracing project from the beginning and one of the co-authors, and uh, I also a member of Specification Council for open tracing. Um, and so today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, really uh, to demonstrate why open tracing and tracing in general is a big deal in the microservices world. Um, and I will uh, do a quick intro into what distributed tracing is, assuming some people may not know it exactly what it is. Um, I will also uh, show you a demo of uh, like really demonstrate why it's useful in, in on, on, a, on an example application. Um, and then, uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, and so um, basically what distributed tracing is, the way I, I tend to think about it, is a new uh, way of monitoring for microservices. And um, so we can ask, why do we need a new way? Why like the old ways don't work? And to answer that question, I want to kind of uh, show you a rendering by an artist of the microservices versus uh, a monolith application. Um, and so what microservice is really, the, the big, biggest difference obviously is that the pieces of the previous big application are now individual pieces that work independently of each other. And so when we were monitoring uh, a, like a monolithic application, we would put like a, some probe on it. It could be metrics, it could be some stream of uh, standard logs out and we can see what's going on in that application and things are pretty simple there. Uh, but in microservices, how you do the same thing is is not that obvious. So you can definitely put a thermometer on every one of those guys, but they don't give you the whole the whole picture of what's going on with the whole system. Uh, and more importantly, if we think about um, another aspect, specifically the concurrency, uh, so we like the old application started the single threaded where you would process one request at a time. Uh, then it became more complex with multi-threading where multiple requests like uh, being processed in parallel but still one request per thread. And then we went into asynchronous programming where uh, a single request can actually jump between different threads uh, during its life cycle. And finally, in the microservices world, we, we took that asynchronous picture and split it across many different processing boundaries. Um, and uh, the picture would be broken. Um, and, and so what we really want to see here when we monitor that system is to, to, tr to be able to track a single request uh, as it goes not only between multiple threads, but between multiple process boundaries. Um, and, and, and that's what distributed tracing really provides. It, it is, is the ability to trace a single transaction throughout your architecture um, and throughout process boundaries, threads, whatever, continuations, uh, asynchronous calls, and all these things. Um, and conceptually, the way it works is that fairly straightforward. There is a, uh, a, context, a concept of context propagation where we say if we have a microservice architecture with these five microservices and the first service receives a request, we uh, create a unique ID for that request and we stick it in a so-called context, which is like a virtual container which is associated with that request. And that context is propagated by whatever means throughout every single call downstream. 
uh, as part of processing that request. And when we do that, it allows us to stitch together all those independent pieces of execution across the call graph uh, and build a timeline of that same request where we can see, well, the whole request took that much time in the series A, then series A called series B, B called C and D, et cetera. Um, and so that, that view is a typical view that tracing systems provide based on the tracking of the request that they um, have. Um, so, but why should you care? Like why, why, why is it a good idea to actually do these things? And now I wanna jump into, into the demo. And uh, so I will demonstrate the demo based on the, on the Jaeger as a, uh, an open source tracing system. Uh, and plus inside that repository, there's a, a application called Hotrod, um, which is a sample microservices application uh, that I will be using here. So first I wanna start the Jaeger backend. So I have, um, where am I? Uh, in a GitHub uber.jaeger, um, this is our main repository. So I can start the uh, kind of Jaeger backend a single, with a single command go. And um, I'll just give it a second. Uh, so one thing it shows here is that it started Jaeger query service at, at this port, right? So that's the Jaeger UI that we'll be using later. And then I'm gonna, again, this is a similar, same repository, but the subdirectory examples Hotrod. So I can start uh, the this application as well. And uh, I wanna pay attention to the logs here because one thing that it says, it says it's starting a whole bunch of services like root service, front end customer and uh, driver service. So just by looking at these logs, we kind of can get a sense that this is a, apparently a microservices based application because it's starting a whole bunch of things. And so, uh, but the front end is obviously the entry point. So let's go to that, um, to the UI of that application. I can make it a bit bigger like this. Um, so just as a quick enter, intro, this, uh, this uh, sample application is, uh, is like a mock uh, rides on demand thing where you have these customers and you click a button uh, and the back end kind of finds the car which is uh, closest to that uh, to that uh, customer and says, okay, well, uh, the car will arrive in two minutes. And it gives you the license plate number. This is like the New York uh, license plate numbers. Um, and it also gives a few things that uh, will be useful later in the demo. So one thing is like when I loaded this application, there was this um, uh, client request ID, which is just a stable session ID for my page. like. If, if that if I reload that page, I'll get a new ID. Um, there's also, uh, every time there's a request made from this application, the front end, JavaScript front end assigns it like a unique ID, like request number one. Um, and then it also prints the latency, which we'll see uh, it's useful later on, uh, how long it took from the point of view of the front end, right? So, um, now that we see, well, okay, well, this application kind of apparently uh, like dispatched the car to us, but uh, how do we uh, actually see what what the architecture of that application? So we saw from the logs that apparently there are certain microservices involved, but maybe the logs lie, we don't really know. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to Jaeger UI um, and, um, and we will take a look at what, what Jaeger UI out of the box provided. So remember that we executed one request so far with that application for this, this car, right? And so that already provided certain data to Jaeger backend, and we can go and we can see that data, for example, in this format. Um, so by observing traces that, that or really it's a single trace, uh, by observing that interaction of microservices, we can actually see what happened within uh, that service. So there was a front end service which called uh, three downstream services, and two of those called apparently some storage backends like Redis and MySQL. Uh, and we also see that the counts, how many times. So just for this single web request, there are apparently over like 25, 27 uh, RPC calls that happened within that uh, microservice based ap application. Um, so that kind of gives us an architecture uh, overview of the application, but it doesn't tell us what the actual workflow uh, and the data flow was, like which services was called first and how long it took. And for that, we can go back to the main uh, page of Jaeger. And then uh, because the services like emitted tracing data to the backend, we already have this information. For example, all the services kind of presented uh, and known to the Jaeger UI. So if we search for a trace, um, we see that this is the, the one trace that was executed uh, by the system. And, uh, and it says that 
there are like 51 spans. I will go into that a bit later. And then there's all the services that are involved uh, and how long it took. It took 743 milliseconds. So notice that this is a bit shorter than 750 milliseconds reported by the UI, which isn't surprising because UI is measuring it from its point of view, where the uh, Jaeger measures from the backend point of view. So there's some network delay uh, between the UI and the, and the, and the backend. Uh, which is responsible for the, dis the discrepancy here. Um, and so when I go to that trace, uh, I now see that uh, picture that I showed in a slide before. So it's a timeline view of the trace. Um, so which means that this is a time and this every every horizontal bar represents like a unit of work uh, performed by a certain service. Uh, in particular, we can see from the top that uh, the very first request was for the front end service and endpoint called dispatch. Uh, and then, in order, that service called, um, like if you go down kind of a parent-child relationship, we can see that this front-end service called the customer service uh, with the customer endpoint, and the customer did some MySQL operation. Then the front-end called the driver service, and then the driver service did a whole bunch of other calls apparently to Redis, like first find driver IDs, and then uh, a whole bunch of get driver requests apparently to like retrieve driver information. And then some of them we can see fail, like they're marked by the exclamation point. So uh, they took longer and, and then most of them have succeeded. Uh, and finally, in the end, the front end service, like after the uh, driver call, the front end did a whole bunch of requests to, to the root service. Um, and so again, we don't really know how and wh what's the business logic here, but at least we see the data flow of this application. And then once that uh, all these uh, root requests were executed, in the end, the front end produced the result and the front end displayed it, the, the UI displayed. So this is kind of a very simple uh, walkthrough of the workflow application just by looking at the single trace, right? It gives us a lot of context of what happened in this micro, like four, seven, whatever microservices. Um, in, in this application. Um, now, uh, just a bit more details about this trace. So um, distributed tracing kind of allows you not only see that information, but also drill down into individual pieces of every every span. And again, span is just a unit of work within the application which was instrumented with a particular kind of annotation. Um, and so we can, for example, like in the MySQL, we can, we can expand that um, MySQL span and we can see, oh, there was this, uh, we can see that the actual SQL statement was this that executed. We also see the request ID <clears throat> from the, remember that request ID in the UI, this guy. Um, and we also see something in the log, uh, uh, which is associated with that span. So this information kind of uh, allows you to, if, if, if there's an error, and in particular, let's look at this, uh, the error cases where we see Redis calls fail. So if we drill down into that, we can see that, especially in the logs, that uh, apparently it was a timeout basically on, on Redis, uh, uh, which caused that request to fail. And then the backend, or oh, sorry, the, the driver service retried it with another request. Um, so uh, this is kind of, again, uh, just like a quick walkthrough through the uh, capabilities of the tracing system. Um, this is very common functionality. One sec. So, uh, but however, we still don't quite know what the actual business logic within the application. For example, why did the front end call the customer service, right? And so, uh, to understand that, um, we can actually um, turn again to logging and and try to understand the behavior of the application based on the logs. But before we do that in a trace, let's take a look at the logs here. Uh, so. And look, it's like I'm scrolling. This was one single request, right? So uh, there's like a several pages of logs that were written to standard out by this application. So uh, we can probably figure out what happened uh, in, in this request by like reading very carefully, especially if you're like the guy from the on the brunette. Uh, but in, like I find this very difficult to actually follow through exception, like exception traces. And Im remember that we only did one single request so far. Like if this uh, was a real production service and it was serving like 100 requests per second, 
these logs will be a complete mess. Uh, everything would be interleaved and there is no way to tell what actually is happening, what's the logic of the application. So instead of looking at the logs, we can actually look at the logs in the tracing system. And specifically, if we look at the front end service, the very top span, we can see that it has 17 logs. Um, and if we expand that, now all those requests that we saw in the standard out, they're kind of the same, same logs, but they're now very uh, contextualized to say, okay, well, I only see in logs from this particular span, like some other spans like MySQL, it had its own logs, the Redis calls, they had its own logs. So they were like in the log output, they would be all mixed up. Here, I'm only seeing what's relevant to the span. So that's what we call contextualized logging that uh, tracing provided. It kind of allows you to narrow down the behavior of a particular execution uh, very closely. And by looking at the log, we can now actually understand the actual, the actual business logic that the application is doing. So once it received the request, it says, I'm going to load uh, the customer information by customer ID, which was sent by the UI. Then uh, I'm going to find the nearest drivers to that customer. I'm load, loading all the information for those drivers. And then I'm going to find routes for each of those drivers. And then finally, pick the shortest and dispatch it back to the, to the, um, to the front end. Um, so again, uh, the, the main point here is that the logs are very contextualized to every individual span. They're, they're not mixed up with anything else. Um, and also, um, we can see that uh, I, sh I was showing like logs and tags. Uh, this is a, like a standard feature in open tracing. Tags are really the things that you want to assign to the whole span, uh, kind of a description of the span. For example, uh, it's, a, it's like I'm calling my SQL service. The span kind is that I'm a client of my SQL service. Right? Whereas logs are really things with a timestamp. So uh, like if, if you if you meet in something at the point in time, then it's a log. Otherwise, if it's the whole descriptor of the of the attribute of a span, then it's a tag. Um, so that's like a standard terminology in open tracing. Um, and finally, the last kind of uh, I guess not the least uh, uh, important thing of of tracing is that we can see the overall latency of of this request and uh, what was on a critical path and what was uh, was taken uh, basically 750 milliseconds to execute this request, right? So we can see that MySQL query took over 300 milliseconds. So something to, to look into. Uh, then another thing we can see is that the loading of the drivers took another 200 milliseconds. And by looking at this kind of staircase pattern in the trace, we can understand that, oh, all these drivers were requested from Redis sequentially, right? So another potential optimization for this application saying, maybe we could just call them all in parallel and just reduce it to just a few milliseconds instead of 200. And finally, uh, the request to the root service. Um, this is interesting, like we see that they are actually uh, concurrent, right? So we see a whole bunch of um, uh, of concurrent requests, but they all not, they're not all concurrent. So actually, in fact, there is at most three concurrent requests going on to the root service. And then as soon as one of them stops, like first stop, uh, another one started, right? This stopped, uh, sorry, uh, this stopped, another one started. So it, it looks like there is some executor pool which is bounded by the three threads. And that's like, so the parallelism of this, of this whole uh, segment of the trace is limited by three. And so again, potentially another optimization point to improve the application latency. Uh, so now let's see what how this application actually performs if we start doing a lot more requests, right? If I start clicking many times here. Um, and so we can see that the latency is starting to climb. Uh, essentially, the more requests, the longer it takes. Uh, and notice that request IDs keep like incremented, as I mentioned before. So uh, how can we use tracing to investigate it? Uh, so I, I'm going to pick this uh, like this driver ID or license plate ID. Um, and then try to search for a trace with this ID. And tracing allows you to, um, I think it's like driver ID. This, um, no space. So we can, we can find, oops. Um, let's see what the, okay, the syntax is. Just a driver, okay. Uh, so I'm looking at this thing. Uh, it says driver um, equals license plate. So I can search by that tag. So not driver ID, but just driver. Okay. So now I get this trace and we see like it's, it's the one that was actually very long, like almost 200 milliseconds. So this one is saying 182, close enough, right? So when we look at this trace, 
immediately we see, oh, MySQL is taking an enormous amount of time here, 1.4 seconds. Uh, so clearly there is something wrong with that application. There is some bottleneck. And let's actually use the login feature of the tracing. If we jump into the logs, we can see, oh, this request is actually blocked by four other transactions. Uh, and it was waiting for over almost like a second until it acquired that log and allowed to proceed to, to, <clears throat> to query MySQL. What that means is like in practice, this is obviously a mock application, but what it, it simulates a real uh, environment where you only have one, one like connection to the database instead of using a connection pool. Um, what's, what's another interesting thing though here is that not only we see that how many transactions are blocking us, we also see the actual request IDs of those transactions. So imagine that um, there, you, you were in this scenario where there is some resource which has a queue in front of it. And every time you execute a request, you actually have to wait in the queue for something else to, to get processed. And suddenly you see this kind of pattern where, oh, you got stuck for a long time in the queue. And then when you look into this thing, you can say, oh, well, these are all the requests that are blocking me. What if I go and look for those requests um, and see which one was actually the longest and, and uh, caused this, all this blocking in the queue? Uh, and that allows you to do that. But what's interesting is that uh, if we look at the customer service, there is this uh, HTTP request that was executed. It says nothing about request ID. Uh, it only says, well, give me a customer information. So a request ID came all the way from the, uh, from the front end, from the JavaScript UI. But it wasn't passed as a request parameter to the service. So how did this guy know about uh, all these transaction IDs, right? Um, and the answer is because uh, it's another feature of Open Tracing API called Baggage. And Baggage is essentially, uh, remember I talked about uh, context propagation, uh, where uh, tracing is, is using context propagation to pass around trace ID. But context propagation itself is a more general concept. You can essentially pass anything. Uh, and so baggage is this kind of anything key value store, which is passed around the whole architecture as part of the request. And so this request ID that um, UI uh, creates for every request is actually injected into the baggage, and then it becomes available at every level of the of the call graph. So every microservice can actually get access to that ID without having to change any of the APIs of, of that service, right? Um, uh, which is very important, like if you have multiple levels of microservices and you want to pass something from the top to, to the storage layer, for example, uh, having to go and change all the APIs of the services in between is usually very um, like difficult work, uh, whereas baggage allows you to do that almost for free. Um, so, uh, so we figured out that, okay, MySQL is kind of the culprit. So what we can do is we can go and fix um, that, um, we can go and fix uh, like this, this uh, locking, um, contention and I don't know if I have time to actually do that uh, so I may uh, well let me try to do that um, you've got time go for it yeah so I'll go to um, to the code for the application Let's see where it is. Where am I? okay yes um, so and this was in the customer service, so in the database. Um, and <laughs> so funnily enough, right, we see that there's this log that uh, we saw the log about it. Um, and so the reason this log is here, like I said, this is a mock application. So it simulates like a single connection thread pool. So uh, simplest way is this let's just comment it out and not, not uh, block on this one transaction. Um, and then the actual transaction to the database is simulated by this uh, sleep statement which has a certain delay right and so i also want to just for demonstration purposes i want to go and reduce that uh delay to to make it a bit shorter uh, and and see how this this small change uh really affects the behavior of the application okay so we started again reload this page note my session id changed now um, and so again i do a whole bunch of requests so what we see now is that latency is still kind of going above the first one, but it's not as dramatic anymore as it used to be, right? It doesn't go to two seconds. And so if I pick again the latest, like, sorry, the longest trace and try to search for it, we'll see how that change in the code that we just made affects the, the trace shape. So here, I change it to 100 milliseconds, so that's what roughly we get now. 
and so the the whole shape of the trace changed significantly it's still long i mean it's like over a second uh but this this segment became shorter the call to the driver is still the same 200 milliseconds because i really haven't optimized this thing but notice how this change this segment changed now so remember we used to see three at a time but instead we're actually seeing sometimes one sometimes not even less than one request uh being executed so my whole request is being blocked like we can see it in the minimap uh there's these gaps in the execution where my my request is actually not doing anything it's just waiting on the resources right and again as i mentioned this this front end the the root service has some sort of a thread pool inside it and that thread pool is bound by three executors and so when i execute a lot of requests then obviously there's a contention on that resource and we can easily see the impact of that contention on the trace and so what if we go and fix it as well uh so and it's happened to be like very close to 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 um in the same configuration so and this is a go routine so they're cheap i'm going to go 200 um, and again let's see the impact of that change I swear my laptop is usually faster. It's the video that's slowing down. Um, okay, so we got this uh, application started, reloaded again, uh, and now, uh, like, <laughs> because I optimized a whole bunch of stuff in this uh, in this call, I have to click really, really fast to actually get any sort of latency uh, shown. You see, like, how requests are uh, coming back immediately. So, um, like, and they're all uh, way shorter than before. And like, so if I pick the longest one, uh, just to see uh what what actually is happening with it now okay notice that there's lots of more errors for some reason i don't know why that is interesting the errors are actually random and so like it's it's kind of surprising why why there are more errors but uh like we can see actually this the impact of that last change that uh so we have 10 drivers being requested or like a 10 routes being requested from the root service and now we can see that they all executed in in parallel because we have essentially removed the contention on the resource pool uh, on on a thread pool uh, so this again this is i guess i hope like this is a demonstration of the tracing functionality and like how tracing can help you quickly narrow down what the problems are in individual uh, components of your architecture individual services and how you can try to optimize this by looking at either relationships between the calls, uh, critical paths. Like here, if we if we look at this whole trace now, then obviously the critical path uh, is going through this segment, and this is a longer segment. And the most obvious optimization here is just to try to parallelize this thing, right? Instead of doing sequential. But I'm not going to do that in this demo. It's like a, an exercise if you want to do it yourself. Um, okay, so. And the final thing that I want to show here is that, um, so I mentioned baggage. Uh, I want to show another use case for baggage. Uh, and uh, this application actually emits a whole bunch of metrics. So if I go to uh, this, yes, this, um, I mean, it's another port that this application exposes. So we can see a whole bunch of metrics emitted. Uh, by the way, some of them are, I think, if I search for, uh, um oh i actually don't have metrics from the tracer itself so uh it's probably not configured normally the tracer itself emits metrics about how many spans it starts or, or stops um and instead what's configured here is the rpc metrics so we can see that all the services and all their endpoints are actually being measured by by jaeger and emitted as metrics so uh like tracing in general uh does a heavy sampling of the request we don't capture every single trace in the storage but metrics work for all requests. And so you can get very, very pretty accurate picture of how your application is behaving uh, by looking at the metrics. And this is something that Gary will talk in the second segment of this presentation. But what I wanted to really show here is this part. So notice that this is a metric which says uh, how many, how much time the root service calculation in the root service spent in seconds on behalf of an individual customer or on behalf of individual uh web session and remember that this my web session id is this one right um and, and so well it's kind of nice look at the root service let me collapse this thing <clears throat> so 
pick any request to the root service and look at its HTTP request itself. Again, there is no mentioning of either the customer or uh, of the web session ID in the request because, well, they don't belong to the API of the root service. It really cares only about where we start and where we drop off. So just like two coordinates, all it needs. Uh, and yet it is able to produce these metrics uh, by, by the customer and by the session ID, which, which are the identifiers which are only available at the very top of the application. Essentially, the, the front end service knows that, but it doesn't pass it explicitly to the root service. So I'm kind of repeating this myself, but I, I just want to make sure that this is very important and uh, like powerful feature of open tracing where baggage propagation can allow you to do a lot of smart stuff by kind of this implicit propagation of the data that you can use uh, at the lower stack of your application and let's say do resource attribution. Um, I can say, well, I can uh, maybe do a chargeback to my to my like customer saying, oh, you you use so much uh, compute resources from my application by like all the requests going to your customer, right? So this is something that um, essentially distributed context propagation allows you to do. Um, and finally, uh, one other thing that I want to um, go over in this uh, presentation is really so. I hope that you like this functionality and you think tracing is great. So great. Uh, like how how difficult is it actually to instrument that application to to get all this data and all these traces? Uh, and the answer is it's actually not that hard. And in fact, if we look at the source code for this application, there will be surprisingly very little uh, information, very little instrumentation for tracing explicitly. And the reason for that is because Open Tracing API is, is an open source API that any framework can use to instrument itself. In particular, any RPC framework can use to instrument itself. And as a result, uh, if we look at the source code for any of the services, let's say we look at the front end service. So when we're creating a server, we see that there is this like one mentioning of, of, a, of a tracing for instrumentation, which really just creates a wrapper around the, uh, the server. And then once that's done, all the requests through that server are automatically traced. You don't need to do anything special. Um, similarly, uh, there is another service here. I forgot which one, I think it's a root service. So when it starts, this one is not based on HTTP, or it is actually, maybe it's a driver. So the driver server, yes. So the driver server is not based on HTTP. It uses a T channel, which is another RPC framework, open source RPC framework. And that framework is instrumented with tracing by itself, uh, with open tracing. And so what we can see here in the, in the code is that when I'm creating this new channel, the only thing I'm passing it is the tracer. And, and that's it. There's no more instrumentation anywhere in this in this service to actually enable tracing. In fact, if we look at the handler, so this is the handler function which is being called by the by the server. Uh, there is no mention in the of open tracing here anywhere, right? It just gets a context object, which is a common way for tracing to propagate data inside the application, and then tracing kind of happens behind the scenes automatically. Uh, again, because because open tracing is an open API that anyone can use. Uh, if you are writing your RPC framework or you're writing your, I don't know, Redis driver uh, in particular language, you can you can uh, write uh, open tracing instrumentation either into your driver directly or provide like a wrapper, which what happens with the HTTP, like there is a standard libraries and open tracing contributor um, space, which allow you to wrap HTTP clients and servers and, and, and not really worry about tracing. However, if you do want to trace explicitly, then obviously open tracing allows you to do that. And there are examples in this application, like Redis, for example, this is not a real Redis, it's just a simulation of Redis. And so to uh, to actually simulate that we're making some, some sort of RPC request, there is explicit instrumentation for open tracing. We're saying, okay, start a new span here, uh, uh, representing a call to Redis. And we're saying that this is a RPC client kind of, kind of span, right? So. Those are the tags that we've seen in a tracing example, and and this is the only really place in this code where uh, open tracing instrumentation is done explicitly, simply because there is no real uh, Redis server. If there was, then you probably could get away without explicit instrumentation for that. Um, and uh, finally, another thing I want to mention is, uh, so we've seen how logs go both to standard out and the same logs uh, appear in the, in a tracing. Um, and in fact, I'm going to go back to to this service. So uh, 
we can see an example of the log statement here. So it looks pretty normal, right? So info, uh, this is a kind of a key value login framework uh, that Zap is a login framework which allows you structured login. So rather than uh, formatting a string with a, like a formatter, you provide key value pairs explicitly and it's a lot more efficient in Go. There are no memory allocations and it's easy to suppress. Uh, however, the, the really difficult dif difference here from normal login is this part, right? So instead of just calling logger info, um, if we did that, then we wouldn't be able to associate logs with the actual context because they would just go to standard out. And this is just a little trick in this application where the logger isn't really the normal logger, but it's a, it's a wraparound logger which allows you two methods. Either uh, you can get a background logger which doesn't require context and can log your standard like lifecycle uh, application uh, messages, or if you have something that is request specific. In this case, it's obviously a scope to this particular request, find nearest car. So we get a different type of logger for that context. And as soon as we do that, there is a magic that you can look in the source code, how it's actually the same log is forked into both standard out and into a tracing span. And that's why I am able to, cap to show it in the, in the UI. But when it's associated with a span, you get contextualized login versus like a standard loud mess. Um, so I'm just checking that. Oh, yes. And that's uh, the end of my, and just like the very final point is open tracing uh, doesn't bind you to any particular tracing optimization, right? So um, here we used Jaeger, but if we look at how tracing is actually initialized, uh, this is the only single place in this whole application, which is specific to Jaeger. We're saying, uh, configures the project from Jaeger, this one, I guess. Yeah, so it's a, uh, we can see that Jaeger client. That's the only place where it is actually specific to Jaeger, right? So we instantiate Jaeger tracer, and from that point on, the rest of the application is not aware that there is anything to do with Jaeger. If you want to swap it for Zipkin or for Lightstep or for any other open tracing compliant tracer, this is the place to do it, and it will work just as well. Your UI will be different, obviously, but um, the, the actual instrumentation doesn't need to change. Uh, so that, I think, is the uh, end of my demo. So uh, let me see. Yes. Yeah, so as a recap, um, what we've done is I, I've showed that uh, instrumentation itself is pretty much off the shelf. I didn't have to change a lot of stuff in my application. Uh, I can swap another tracer. So there's a vendor neutrality to the whole open tracing API. Uh, and tracing allows you to monitor transactions across multiple microservices and process boundaries and different threads as well. Um, we can definitely things, do things like latency, measuring latency operations, finding a uh, critical path, analyzing root cause of some errors or uh, delays in the execution. We can get contextualized login, very highly contextualized login with tracing. Uh, we talked about baggage propagation, how it's a very powerful technique. In fact, at Uber, we have a number of projects which are built strictly on top of baggage propagation. They really don't even have to do anything with tracing, but they rely on Jaeger instrumentation because they need baggage propagation. Um, and, and I showed quickly the RPC metrics, but that's something that Gary will talk more uh, in the next uh, session. And just a few words about uh, Jaeger. So Jaeger is a, a distributed tracing system. We open sourced it uh, in April this year. Uh, it's open tracing inside, so it's like built from open tracing from the beginning. Uh, it can be used as a drop-in replacement for Zipkin if you want to just replace the backend. Uh, it's, the backend is all in Go. We support several uh, backend storages, and this is the main URL for, for Jaeger. And we'll come to that slide while, after Gary's presentation. I'll stop sharing now. All right. We'll get Gary to share his screen and, and kick off his, his bit. Hi, uh, can you see my screen? Um, it's coming soon. <laughs> You've got your sharing screen, so click into your Jaeger browser. There you go. Okay. Um, right, I'll uh, try to get through this demo uh, fairly quickly. Um, thanks for the, the demo, Yuri. Um, so what I'm going to do is just show how um, we can use some, uh, an open tracing system like Jaeger, um, but also capture application metrics and um, integrate with something like Prometheus. Um, and have that all running on OpenShift. Um, it, the, um, this example also runs on Kubernetes, and um, there's a GitHub repository um, located here, um, where you can find the example and the instructions for running on both. 
Um, so the, the, the main aim of this uh, short demo is to show how we can sort of capture the, the metrics um, along with the, the tracing just by instrumenting the application uh, with the open tracing standard. Um, and uh, as Yuri pointed out, there's, there are ways in which we can make um, the, the, the instrumentation of the applications uh, non-intrusive by instrumenting um, a number of uh, the popular frameworks. Um, and the, the benefit of capturing the tracing and application metrics information separately is we can report them to our preferred backend um, systems and um, the, the, the sort of metrics we're going to be capturing isn't constrained by the particular tracing uh, sampling policy that we want to use. Um, because um, application metrics is useful um, to be able to capture for the application invocations um, and have alerting mechanisms to detect situations. Uh, but the tracing information is, is useful when you want to, to dive into um, more information about a particular invocation of the application. Um, there's also um, on the cards um, some uh, adaptive sampling mechanisms um, that we're, we're, um, Uber are looking to put into Jaeger. Which, for example, if you um, if you get an alert um, on a particular area of your system, um, that could potentially be used to um, automatically increase the tracing information that's being captured um, in advance of somebody being able to um, investigate the problem. Um, so, in terms of the um, example I'm showing, it's a very simple Spring Boot application um, consisting of two services: an order manager and an account manager. Uh, the order manager has um, a couple of REST endpoints for buying and selling and, and one to generate uh, an exception, basically, um, as it tries to invoke a, a missing endpoint. Um, and then the, app, the account manager just has a simple account um, endpoint. Um, so both of the services are using the Open Tracing API, um, which in terms of the tracer, we're using Jaeger, um, but we're also decorating the tracer uh, with a, a new um, component in the Open Tracing Contrib. Um, GitHub organization um, that basically intercepts the, the tracing information and extracts um, relevant metrics. Um, and these have been reported in this case to Prometheus. Okay, so um, there's um, also a blog on the, the Red Hat developer program um, that explains how to run this on, on Kubernetes. Um, there's uh, a GitHub organization called uh, uh, Jaeger Tracing where you can find um, the templates for uh, deploying um, Jaeger onto Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, and the, um, as I mentioned, there's the, the Java metrics um, component that decorates the tracer can be found in, in this organization here in this repo. Okay, so um, what I've done is I've, I've already deployed the, um, the example. Um, so there's the account manager and the order manager. Uh, I'm using Prometheus operator uh, which is an extension um, project to Prometheus, um, which um, is able to identify services that have been deployed um, and if there's multiple instances of the services um, and be able to update the configuration in Prometheus to, to scrape the metrics from those, um, those services. Um, and of course, we've got uh, Jaeger deployed as well. Um, before um, viewing the demo, I'll just uh, quickly go through um, the application. Um, so as I said, this is a, a Spring Boot application um, the, the, the main application itself, um, as you can see, there's no tracing specific um, code added here um, for the account manager and same for the, the controller, the REST endpoint itself. Um, so um, uh, this is basically just um, introducing a bit of a delay to make the metrics more interesting um, and then randomly creating an exception saying if I uh, failed to find account. Um, the, the configuration of Prometheus um, is uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the metrics are being reported um, using a servlet, um, which is exposed at the, uh, this endpoint here. Um, and the tracing configuration um, is, is basically using um, a, a component of um, the open tracing um, project called the tracer resolver. So in this case, what we're doing is um, we're, we're obtaining the tracer based on configuration information. So in the same way that Yuri was pointing out, you could you know, just change the code in one place. Um, in, if you're using the tracer resolver and the tracing implementation supports it, then it can be done without any code change at all. Um, but in this case, we're, we're decorating the tracer before it gets returned um, using this, uh, uh, this component here um, with a Prometheus metrics reporter. 
Um, with Prometheus, the metrics are reported um, with a set of labels. So, it, it, um, from the stand uh, in a standard way, what we're doing is we're using um, labels to represent things like the service name, the operation, um, and various other fields that can then be used to um, sort of categorize the metrics. Um, but um, through this mechanism, you can also customize um, and add to your own labels as well. Um, so in this case, what, what I'm doing is adding a baggage label. Um, so this is using the mechanism that Yuri talked about, where um, application-specific information can be propagated with the trace in context through a chain of the services that are being invoked. Um, so what, what this one is doing is it's adding a, a transaction name. So this could be a business transaction. Uh, and the second parameter is just a default value. So in this case, we're, um, if if one hadn't, if a baggage um, item with that name hasn't been provided, then we just use this value. Um, the other thing in terms of the tracer configuration is we need to tell it to ignore uh, the rest endpoint um, slash metrics because that's been used to to scrape the Prometheus um, metrics. Um, I'll just have a uh, just to the order manager because this is slightly different. The, the application itself, again, has no um, tracing specific code, um, but the, the, the controller um, does include or injects the tracer. Um, and this is purely just to be able to um, set the baggage item. Um, so what we do is if the, if the buy endpoint is called, then we set the baggage item of transaction to be buy and, and same for, for the sale. And that information would then get propagated through to the account manager service. Okay, so, okay, so if I, uh, th this is the Jaeger UI um, for this particular application. So you can see there's um, there's some uh, transactions. So we've got the order manager, uh, which has the buy endpoint invoked, uh, and that's um, invoking the the account manager. So that's a, a simple um, invocation. And let's see. So th and this one's showing an example of an error. So if I look at the account manager, if I have a look at the logs, um, then you can see that the um, failed to uh, find account uh, has been reported. Uh, but because um, uh, Yuri's done a, a, an in-depth demo of Jaeger, what I'm going to do is focus more on um, Prometheus. Um, so this is using the, the Prometheus um, user interface, and I've set up some, uh, some queries already. Um, so this, this first one, uh, what it's focusing on is um, a metric called span count. Um, so that's just the number of um, spans that have been created at a particular point in the business process. Uh, so if we have a look down here, you can see that there's um, a, a metric that's created for the operation cell on, in the service order manager and the span kind of server. So that's the server um, endpoint um, for that operation and that service. Um, there's a number of um, labels that we're ignoring. Um, to um, simplify the information so that, for example, you can um, view information based on pods, instance, job, namespace, um, the, the transaction field that we added ourselves, the transaction label, and also errors. So at the moment, we're just aggregating over those, those particular fields. Um, there's also, I've got a graph here representing the, uh, the, the duration associated with um, each of those, those spans. So it's looking at the, uh, an aggregated view um, of those particular fields. Um, and for example, we, if we're um, interested in a particular transaction, so we could add a filter. Um, so if we're just interested in the cell transaction, so what this does is it takes, uh, it cuts through um, all of the, the services and is only focusing on the metrics being reported uh, for that particular transaction type. So for example, if you want to find out you know, what the bottlenecks were with a particular business transaction, um, this would be a good way to be able to focus in on that. Um, and similarly, you could, um, uh, if you're interested in um, what's executing um, in a particular part of your infrastructure, um, you can focus on the pods. Um, so uh, because the pod also includes a service name, um, that's quite useful so you can see what, what services are running on that particular pod. But again, it helps you to locate if there's particular problems in your infrastructure. Um, and then and finally, I've got a graph that's um, basically looking at the error ratio between um, the, the, for the, the different services. So again, you can see whether a particular service is starting to generate um, more than um, the usual number of errors. And you can set up alerts that would be um, triggered if certain thresholds were um, ex exceeded. 
Okay, um, so that's uh, just a quick demo. But um, so just to recap, th this is this demo is primarily to to demonstrate the integration of the open tracing technologies with um, something like Prometheus for for capturing application metrics, um, but within uh, the context of a, a Kubernetes or OpenShift environment where you can also capture um, information implicitly about where those um, services are running. Okay. All right. If you could pop into Yuri's last slide, so we have the resources slides up there. And I just want to say really thank you for this. This is wonderful to see sort of the interplay of all these different open source projects and how they all interrelate. And there's a lot of them in here. And this has been um, very, uh, very good way to, to showcase that lots of different things, the Open Tracing Project, Jaeger, Prometheus, um, Spring Boot even, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, I think you've done a pretty awesome job with this presentation because I'm not seeing any questions yet from any of the many folks that are following along. Um, is there any feedback that you wanna add in, Yuri, now that um, uh, Gary's finished his bit? Yeah, people probably lost. <laughs> uh, I, I had to go pretty fast. Um, I just want to mention that so um, a couple of uh, like a few links here. So for the open tracing project itself is opentracing.io, and then there is a, a Gitter chat room if you have questions or want to discuss things. And uh, this is the link. Uh, and then this is the link for Jaeger for the main repository. We also have a chat room uh, for questions and so on. Uh, and uh, the these demos that we given they actually have blog posts that uh, essentially describe what's happening. And in particular, like Hotrod has a very detailed walkthrough uh, blog post that um, uh, kind of talks about the same thing that I talked about, but with more examples and at a slower pace, obviously. And, and, and Gary's blog post that he showed is also here. So if people want to check them out later and actually go to the repositories and look at the codes, so these are the links. All right, well, there are a couple of questions now that I've put people on the spot. Um, Jethro's asking, um, the sampling in Jaeger tracing, is it span level or trace level? Is it, it is head-based or tail-based sampling? Uh, so, yeah, I can answer that. So definitely uh, an expert asking that. So sampling is uh, trace-based. Once a trace is sampled, it essentially uh, remains sampled throughout the whole architecture. Uh, and it is head-based. So the sampling decision is made at the very beginning when the trace ID is generated first time. Uh, that's the only way for us to actually ensure consistent sampling across all microservices. Um, but having said that, we, we actually have various um, work in progress that uh, are trying to like add other ways of sampling things. Yeah, and that was Jethro, who's from um, the Mass Open Cloud that's actually using Jaeger um, today. So um, hopefully we can get some feedback from you guys soon. Um, there's another question from Vikas. Um, did you measure any performance impact after implementation? Um, so th this is kind of very interesting and a very detailed um, question if we really want to go into that. Um, the, the short answer is yes and no, uh, because uh, the actual performance impact cannot be measured in isolation just based on the tracing itself. It really has to be measured within a particular service, within a particular traffic pattern, uh, because it's highly dependent. So um, we usually, at Uber at least, uh, run tracing with a fairly low sampling rate because we have a very high volume, very high traffic. Uh, and, and so because of the very sa low sampling rate, our uh, performance impact from tracing is completely negligible. There's like nothing to talk about even. Um, but if you crank up the sampling rate much higher, then you will start seeing uh, definitely some performance impact. Um, however, the reason why that question is actually very difficult to answer is because that performance impact is itself very hard to measure because um, it's not just like how much CPU time uh, or CPU load you add to the to the service. There's all kinds of other applications like how much memory pressure you create, how, how much throughput is affected because trace collection happens in a critical path of the application of the request themselves but trace reporting happens in the background, and yet that background work 
uh, is somewhat expensive if you sample a lot of data. And so that starts affecting your application throughput and, and latency. Um, and that's why like it's like it's you really have to try it out. I mean, with a low sampling rate, you're not going to have any performance impact. But if you want to um, go to very high sampling rate, then yeah, definitely need to try it out and see what happens. So Narayanan is asking actually a, a good question. Um, uh, can we enable on-demand tracing with this if performance is a concern? Um, and Gary's come back with a little bit of an answer. Gary, you want to try? Um, yeah, I mean, it's probably better if Yuri answers, but um, I believe we were working on an adaptive sampling mechanism that, that would address that. So you would be able to switch off the, the tracing um, and enable it for certain scenarios when, when a problem occurs. Um, yeah, I can add to that. So there are two parts here. The adaptive sampling, um, first of all, it solves the problem of uh, having very low throughput endpoints, which would be affected if you have very low sampling rate in a the tracer, then some of your endpoints may be sampled and some others may never be sampled because of the, they're just very low QPS. So adaptive sampling takes care of that and guarantees certain uh, throughput of traces for any endpoint. Uh, and the second feature of adaptive sampling is what, uh, so what, what Gary mentioned is that it actually <clears throat> dynamically adjusts to the traffic from your endpoint and it can either increase or decrease uh, the sampling rate uh, based on like certain throughput that desired throughput into the storage. Uh, but I think what this question was really about is like on-demand uh, sampling, and that's possible via two ways. One way is you can do that programmatically. Open Tracing has a standard tag called sampling priority. If you set it on a span with a non-zero value, then <clears throat> Jaeger interprets it as a, as a signal that you want to kind of turn that trace into a debug trace, and it's going to be guaranteed sampled across the stack. And it also bypasses any downsampling that may be happening on the collection layer. Uh, so that's one way. Or if you don't want to do it programmatically, Jaeger also supports, uh, Jaeger clients support a special header. I think it's called like Jaeger dash debug. Um, you can pass a sort of correlation ID as part of that header, and then it will also trigger the debug functionality for a trace. And then you can go and find that trace by that correlation ID that you provide in the header. So that's useful if you want to like send a curl request into your application uh, from outside and just saying, I want to trace this curl request where obviously you cannot set programmatically anything because it's curl it's not instrumented with open tracing but header allows you to do that okay. um does uh jerry's asking does the adaptive sampling idea use the circuit breaker pattern um not quite sure about yeah i'm not sure uh what, what that means but uh, yeah it's basically uh, adaptive sampling uh, it works at the central collection tier and it measures all the traffic that's coming from a particular endpoint of a particular service and it has a target and, and if we see like oh we want 100 traces per second started by this endpoint and if we, if we see a thousand then we're going to reduce the sampling probability by 10 times so that, that's how it works so I, I guess it's like kind of a circuit breaking um, and we have one last question. I think we can sneak in here. Jethro is again asking, branching and merging are not captured, right? It is by design, not in the Dapper model. Is that? You didn't get that. It might be just a yes. I think there's potential for um, the open tracing model to, to support it. Um, because it has, uh, it can handle multiple parent references, um, which I, um, the DAPA model is a single parent approach. Um, but I don't know if, um, I, I think more work may be required in the standard, um, just to maybe define additional references for reference types. Yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, the uh, the references mechanism in open tracing does allow you to have multiple parents, uh, but there hasn't been like a lot of work put on that. Uh, specifically, there's no reference type defined for that use case uh, currently, but there are open issues that if you want to uh, like uh, provide an opinion, uh, there's definitely an issue about that. Um, and, and other similar situations where you want to, there's a related issues like when you want to link to different traces, uh, then you can also use the reference uh, mechanism to um, to link them. All right. So um, that is really all we have time for. And I really appreciate um, Yuri and Gary for taking the time out today um, to do this. If you guys are interested in
Jaeger or open tracing. I know like Yuri just mentioned, there's a lot of issues on the, the Uber Jaeger GitHub repo um, that you can weigh in on and give feedback on. We'd love to hear from you all and um, stay tuned for, for lots of uh, new things um, coming with Jaeger. And we'll probably get these guys back on again sometime soon with sort of a roadmap where we're going from here kind of talk. And, um, and then hopefully some of you were, have mentioned that you're using it in production on, on your POCs can also you know, talk about um, some, of, some of the work that you're doing to implement this and the benefits or whatever um, at your facility. So if you'd like to also be part of this, um, just give us a shout. And again, thank you all for joining us today. And this will be up on the OpenShift blog post and a few other places um, within the next day or so. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you.